Chapter 5 Paper Bag Eddie Stung by Ross's jibe, Dan spent much of his time the next few days at the wide pool to build endurance and smooth out his stroke. He also swam in the river. Always on the occasion, he was accompanied by Brad or Midge, just father in a boat. Now that the swimming meet was over, the other cubs temporarily turned their attention to various den activities. Brad tried to to assist Dan in deciphering the coded message which had been found in Jock's pocket. However, after three days of work, he gave up in disgust. Maybe it isn't code. After all, he said, returning the paper to Dan, I figure those numerals must stand for letters that spell out a message, but I can't get the hang of it. I think I'll keep trying it, Dan said. Not that it'll mean much if we do puzzle out the thing. Jacques's gone and probably will never see him again. Wonder what became of that kid anyhow, Brad mused. It sure was funny finding him on the beach the way we did. And he never told us his name or explained anything. I'd say there was every indication someone came and took him away. Mr. Hatfield made inquiries, Brad added. No one saw the boy leave the cave. He's unknown in Webster City. Although Dan and the other cubs had kept a close watch on the waterfront, they had sighted no boat which resembled the one that had damaged Mr. Holloway's craft. Therefore, the conviction steadily grew that Mr. Mannheim's speedboat might be the one involved. Mr. Mannheim is well spoken of at the club, Midge's father told the boys. It would be a serious mistake if we made an accusation against him or any of his employees. The boat has been repaired, and as far as I'm concerned, the matter will be dropped. Dan and Mitch said no more about the affair, but in private they often remarked that they thought Wilson Chabowski, the caretaker on Skeleton Island, would bear investigation. I hear he hasn't worked very long for Mr. Mannheim. Dan remarked, and folks say that when his employer is out of town, he rides around in the speedboat like a king. Maybe if we keep our eye open, we'll catch him with it yet, Midge said. He may crack into another boat. On the regular Friday night meeting of the den, the cubs enjoyed the beach treasure hunt, which had been interrupted the, at the previous gathering. Mac and Fred came off victorious, their clues leading them to the buried chest which contained carpenter's tools. The den needs a bookcase, Mr. Hatfield reminded the pair as they admired their find. We'll expect you boys to produce something handsome now that you have the tools. We'll do it too, Mac promised. With the treasure hunt over, all the cubs gathered on the beach for a council fire and feed. Mrs. Holloway passed out hot dogs, sandwiches, chocolate, and thick wedges of pie. When the boys could eat no more, they stretched out on the sand and begged Mr. Hatfield to tell them a ghost story. I might tell you about the ghost of Skeleton Island, he chuckled. A true story? Dan demanded. It may have elements of truth, the cub leader replied. Basically, though, the tale is a product of imagination. You mean you're making up the story, Mitch asked in disappointment. No, the cub leader corrected. I first heard about Skeleton Island as a boy. According to the tale, it was an old pirate stronghold. The river pirates would come upstream and hide their loot on the island. Was any of it ever dug up, Mitch demanded. Not that I've ever heard, but 30 years ago, a man's skeleton was found on the island. That's how the place got its name. What about the ghost? Dan inquired. I'm coming to that part. The old freebooters free supposedly built a tunnel which connected some points of the beach with an old inn that was on the island. Not the hotel that's there now, Brad interposed. I mean the abandoned one that Mr. Mannheim converted into a caretaker's premises? 
I doubt it's the same place, Brad. However, I believe that after the old inn burned down, the present building was erected in its place. That was at least 50 years ago. And the ghost, Red Sewell reminded him? The ghost. Oh, yes, to be sure. The fellow, I'm told, never was very active. On windy nights, shore residents reported seeing a white misty figure moving along the beach. Mist? That's probably what it was, Brad said with a snort. Anyone knows there are no such things as ghosts. I'm more interested in that tunnel. Do you think one actually was built, Mr. Hatfield? I'm inclined to think that part of the story is true, Brad. Then, what became of the tunnel? No one has heard of it in recent years. I was asking an old-timer about that only yesterday. And what did he tell you, Dan demanded, eager for additional details. The old salt claimed that a heavy windstorm blocked off the beach entrance to the tunnel. Could it be relocated and dug out? Probably, if anyone wanted to go to that much work, it would be a big job shifting so much sand, even if the entranceway could be found. I don't suppose Mr. Mayhem ever was interested. He owns the entire island, doesn't he? Brad asked thoughtfully, picking up a piece of driftwood. He fed it to a dying ember on the fire. That's right, the cub leader agreed. The scouts have been dickering with him for nearly six months to purchase a stretch of beach for their permanent camp. They're also considering a site two miles further down river. Which will they take, Chips asked. I should think Skeleton Island would be better because it's closer to Webster City. So far, Mr. Mannheim has asked a fairly steep price and doesn't seem inclined to come down, the cub leader replied. The scout director has made two inspection trips and is well satisfied. Now he wants me to make my recommendation. You said the cubs might go there on an overnight camping trip, Red reminded him. All the cubs waited expectantly for an answer. Yes, if, he plan if the plans work out, we'll make it next weekend, Mr. Hatfield answered. The Den Fathers are planning the trip. The cubs began to talk about the proposed excursion, discussing what they would take with them to the camp. Maybe we'll see the ghost of Skeleton Island while we're there, Chips declared hopefully, or find the entrance to the old tunnel. The cub meeting broke up shortly after 9 o'clock. Dan and Brad remained a few minutes after the others had gone to make certain that the last embers of the beach fire had been extinguished. Then together, they started home, selecting a route which took them along the deserted waterfront. At Clinton Street, the boys turned at a corner, passing a cafe from which issued a discordant note of a piano player. On the curb outside the restaurant stood a short little man who was munching popcorn from a paper bag. His face was sharp and weasel-like, his eyes darting and shrewd. The cubs might have passed him very scarcely a second glance, had it not been taking, talking to another man who looked faintly familiar to Dan. The fellow plainly was a sailor, dark-haired with a sturdy body build. That fellow looks like the one of the men who were in the motorboat that struck the Holloway sailboat, Dan said in an undertone to Brad. Not the little one with the paper bag. No, the other one. I'm sure I've seen him somewhere. Let's watch for a minute. Sliding into a shadowy doorway, Brad and Dan kept their eyes on the pair. However, they were too far away to hear the conversation. A newsboy noticed their interest. Know those guys, he asked, sliding up to them. Dan shook his head, hoping that the boy would move on. See that guy with the paper sack? The lad continued, eager to impart information. Know who he is? Dan shook his head. That's the one that they call... Paper bag Eddie, the boy said, ah, in a low voice. He's a bad one. Paper bag Eddie, Dan repeated, keeping his voice low. Never heard of him. You never heard of paper bag Eddie? Why, he's known it by every cop in town, but they never get munch on him. He's a crook then, Brad interposed. Sure, they say he's the brains of the waterfront gang. Guess what he carries around in those paper bags of his? Popcorn, said Dan. Guess again. He packs a revolver. 
Eddie loafs around the waterfront and you can hardly ever see him without his paper bag. I should think the police would pick him up for carrying a concealed weapon, Brad said. Oh, Eddie ain't dumb enough to go around with a revolver all the time. Mostly you see him munching peanuts or popcorn. And if the cops search him, that's what they find. But if he pulls a job, he slips the revolver into the sack. The cops figured he only has a bag of popcorn. Eddie never has been arrested, Brad inquired. Oh, the cops run him in regularly, and they've never dug up enough evidence to convince him. Eddie's a slick one. Who's his companion, Dad asked. Never saw him before, the newsboys said indifferently. Some sailor, I guess. Apparently aware that they were under scrutiny, paper bag Eddie and his companion glanced briefly at the cubs and sauntered on down the street. A few doors further on, they entered the Green Parrot Cafe. Let's get on home, Brad urged. Dan, however, had another idea. Brad, I'm dead certain that sailor with paper bag Eddie is the one who was operating the motorboat when it crashed into Mr. Holloway's sailboat. He insisted. I'd like to try to pin it on him at the, and end up in plenty of trouble. You know Mr. Holloway advised that the entire matter be dropped. Sure, I know. But that was mostly because Mr. Mannheim is well known at the club. I have a hunch he didn't know anything about the boat incident. And it may not be, have been his speed craft either. Even so, I, was asking, I wasn't asking for trouble if we were trying to strike up an acquaintance with that pair. We don't have to speak to them, Dan urged. Why not follow them into the cafe and take a table nearby? We might hear something interesting. Well, well, Brad hesitated. I suppose it wouldn't do any harm. Okay. Feeling somewhat ill at ease, the two boys entered the green parrot. The room was dingy and dimly lit, its plaster walls streaked with smoke. Only a few customers were visible. Dan and Brad slipped into one booth diagonally opposite the table where paper bag Eddie and his companion sat. You know your orders, Frisk, they heard the one with the weasel face say. When you get the signal, he broke off as he gazed upon Dan and Brad. The cubs instantly looked away, but paper bag Eddie's suspicions had been aroused. Shoving back in his chair, he walked over to the booth. Say, what's the big idea, he demanded in a soft purring voice. I don't know what you mean, Brad returned, meeting his gaze steadily. You followed me in here. Now you're trying to eavesdrop. This is a free country, Brad retorted. If my friend and I want to come in here for a sandwich, I'd like to see you stop us. Would you, eh? The man replied, his lips parting in an ugly smile. He grasped Brad by the shoulder, pulling him halfway out of the booth. Who are you, and what's your game? Before Brad could answer, the proprietor of the green parrot came quickly from the direction of the kitchen. He had seen what was happening and did not want any trouble in his place. Cut it out, Eddie, he said. No rough stuff here. Who are these kids? How should I know? Never saw them before. They were standing outside the cafe watching, Eddie informed the proprietor. When we came in, they followed. I say throw them out. The proprietor hesitated reluctantly to antagonize either party. Throw them out, paper bag Eddie repeated in a tone not to be denied. I'm sorry, boys, the proprietor apologized. I don't want any trouble here. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. We'll go, Brad said. Come on, Dan. In sliding out of the booth seat, Dan bestowed another glance upon the man paper bag Eddie had called Frisk. More than ever, he was convinced that he had not been mistaken in identifying him as the motorboat operator. I've seen you before, he said, halting beside the table. You were handling the wheel of the motorboat that struck our dinghy. That's a lie, the florid-faced man rasped. I've never set eyes on either of you before, and what's more, I don't want to again. Now, if you don't know what's good for you, get out of here. Dan would have stood his ground, but Brad grasped his arm, pulling him firmly, al firmly along. The proprietor followed the two boys out the door. I'm sorry, he apologized once more. Then, in an undertone, he added, Don't come back. For some reason, Eddie has taken a dislike to you, and when he's crossed, he's bad medicine. Do, 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 do.
Thank mm-hmm. you.